you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read verses 12 and 14, and then verse 27. So again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 12 through 14, and then skip down to verse 27. We are continuing our message series that we started uh, that's called Our House Church. Minister Keon Williamson did a wonderful job last week of bringing the word. I told him, I said, I just want you to know this will not be the last time that we ask you to come since you're just up the road. But he did a wonderful job of talking about the midnight power that the church has. So, um, again, we are continuing our message series. I'm going to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 14, and then verse 27. Here's what the word of the Lord says this morning. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. Somebody say one body. Not several bodies, not a few bodies, but one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. In our present day, we could add black or white, Democrat or Republican, rich or poor, American or Chinese. Whoever is baptized into this one spirit, into this one body. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now skipping down to verse 27, it says this. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. For a few moments this morning, I would like to talk about active ingredients. Active ingredients. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather around your word. I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, that I would decrease so that you can increase. And God, that we would be changed as a result of what we hear. We pray this in your name. Let the church of God say, Amen and Amen. My late grandma, Carol Bross, was a baker. She could bake any cake, any bread, any pastry. Grandma Bross knew how to bake. Now, one of the things that she taught me and that I still follow to this day, even sometimes to the annoyance of those I'm cooking for, is you must follow the recipe exactly. Any of you, uh, you're, you, you, you're a direction follower when it comes to cooking. You don't just try to put your foot in it, but you like to follow the directions even to the point where it's ridiculous. I'm one of those. But Grandma Bross said that it's particularly important when you're baking to make sure that you have all of the ingredients that the recipe says. You, you can't just throw whatever you want into something that you're baking or you could have a mess on your hands. And this is especially true when it comes to baking. You can't just finesse what you're baking. You can't just guess and try to get by. You have to have all the ingredients. Now, when you're baking bread, there's a lot of room for error when you're baking bread. You can mess it up quite easily. Because, uh, you know, when you cook bread, you need a little bit of flour. Grandma Ross wouldn't let you get the, you know, cheap generic flour. You got to get the name brand flour. You, you had to pay a little bit more. And you also needed water. But for her, it wasn't just any type of water. It was lukewarm water. And you needed some good sugar, some of that Florida sugar. And you also needed vegetable oil. Not canola oil, not peanut oil, but you needed vegetable oil. And you also need to add a little bit of salt. But there's one ingredient that if you don't have it, your bread is going to be a disaster. Now, I always found this interesting as a young boy because this was the ingredient that you could barely see. It almost seemed so insignificant that you didn't really need it. And that was the yeast. You know, you can leave out 
you know, your salt bread might taste a little bit funny. You could probably leave out your sugar. The bread won't be as scrumptious. But the reality is if you leave out the yeast, the bread will not rise. And what you'll have is flat bread. You won't have the bread that, you know, you want that has risen. You know, leaving out the yeast means that the bread won't rise even though the yeast is the smallest and most insignificant of the ingredients. You see, one thing I learned about baking bread from Grandma Bross is that all the ingredients matter. Every single ingredient plays a role. They all matter. Now, what does this have to do with us? I think that being the church, it's kind of like baking bread because if we're being honest this morning, the church works best when each of us plays the role that God has given to us. Let me say that again. If we're being honest this morning, the church works best when you and I play the role that God has given to us. Now, now here's the thing. God has not called everyone to be a preacher. Amen? Amen. There are some people who you would rather not hear preach. Amen. That is not their gift. But here's the thing, the other gifts and the other talents that people, that God has given to people are valuable. Because I'm here to tell you, some of us who are called to preach are not the ones you want cooking for you. <laughs> Let me say, your pastor may not be the one that you want cooking you some brisket after church on Sunday. He or she may fry it and it may be hard brisket. You don't want your preacher necessarily being the one who handles the finances. Some preachers don't know how to balance a checkbook. The reality is being a church is kind of like baking bread. It only works best when everyone is doing their God-given parts. And here's the problem. When we only focus on some parts, like the preachers or the worship leaders or the people that we see up front, we end up forgetting about the other necessary parts. The, the helpers, the church mothers who pray every day at noon, those who come in and do the landscaping every week, those who help plan out the church's finances, those who go and serve at the senior center. We, we tend to forget about those other parts that are just as necessary. Let me expand that a little bit. Sometimes when we only focus on some parts of the church, especially those gifts and those people who are up front, we forget about those who are doing ministry in ways that go beyond the walls of the church. Some of you have been public school teachers. I believe that there's a ministry in the public school room. Some of you have been faithful business people for years. I believe that there's a ministry in the in the workplace. Some of you, your students. A lot of you, uh, like my daughters and my son and Cody, you all are in school. Do you know that the way that you do your schoolwork and the way that you conduct yourself in the classroom, it can be a ministry. But sometimes we ignore those other parts and we just focus on the ones that we see on Sunday up front. But here's the reality. When we don't have all the different parts of the church, all the different ingredients, the church does not function right. Let me say that again. When we don't have all the parts, all the people, all the different talents, all the different roles, the church does not function right. Now, I believe that Paul wrote today's passage to remind his readers that every single believer is valuable in God's church. Let me say that again. Paul is trying to tell his readers and you and I that every single believer is valuable in God's church. Whether you're a preacher or whether you're a church mother, whether you're a deacon or whether you serve God in the workplace, whether you're a worship leader or you're a student who's just trying to behave in the classroom, regardless of what ministry and what role God has given to you, you are valuable to the church. Amen. Now, Paul uses the human body as a way of illustrating this. He says, you know that a body, it has many different parts that have to work together in order for it to be a body. He says that these many parts uh, like eyes, hands, feet, the heart, they, they, they come together to form one body. They're all needed for the one body. Now, here's the thing that he says. None of these parts on their own form a body. 
you know, your heart is really important. Does anybody know that? Your heart is really important. Right, right, Sister Melinda, in nursing, the, 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 they probably have told you the heart is really important. But if you just have a heart without a body, you don't have a body. You just have a heart. It can't do much good. Maybe you are, uh, you, you know, you got hands. Hands are great, especially if you work with tools and stuff. That's great. But if you have a hand without an arm, that hand's not much good. Or maybe you have a foot that's just out there on its own. Maybe it's in an Air Force One or whatever the young people are wearing these days as far as sneakers. It might look good, but without a leg that's attached to a body, it can't do much. Paul says that the church is a lot like a body. It has different people who have different gifts. It has different people who have different talents. It has different people who have different personality. These are like different ingredients in a baking recipe. But here's the wonderful thing. All these differences come together to form one church, one body. They need each other in order to come together and work. Now, if the church is like a body, we must ask, what exactly is it that keeps all these different people together? I don't know about you, but when I turn on the news, there's examples all over the place of people not being able to be together because they're different. Right? We're going into another election season. I was watching what I thought was a you know pleasant golfing show the other day, and all of a sudden a political ad came on, and it said, this guy's evil. This guy's trying to do this. And then the next ad came on and said, they don't know, that guy's the problem. That's the one that's throwing everything off. Or we're fighting wars all over the place. There's a lot of examples of different people not being able to be together. But, but Paul says the church is like a body and something holds it together. What is it that holds all these different people together? What is it that holds you and I as different people together? Because we're not all the same. We come from different walks of life. We have different struggles. We have different talents. We have different gifts. Some of us have been through things that others have not. We're different people. So what is it that holds us together? Paul tells us that it's God's spirit that holds us together. Paul tells us that it's God's spirit that brings us together with our different gifts and our different talents and our different personalities. The Spirit of God brings us together and gives us power for God's mission. God's Spirit is what makes us into a body, into a team. You see, the church is different because we, we're, we're not held together by money. We're not held together because we all agree politically. We're not held together because we're all the same race. We are held together because the Spirit of God the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is in the church and it brings us together. It doesn't draw us apart. You and I can be together because the Holy Spirit brings us together with all of our different talents and different gifts. You and I are brought together by the God who desires unity amongst his people. Paul then takes this metaphor a step further and he tells his readers who were members in the church in Corinth, Greece, he tells them, y'all are a body. You all are a body. I understand that you all are different. You all have different things that you do. You, you, you have different experiences, but you all are one body. Well, whose body are they? Paul says they are the body of Christ. Now, let me dig into this a little bit deeper because sometimes we miss it. Paul says to this church, you all are the body of Christ, and each of you has a different part in it. You see, as they contribute their different God-given gifts to the church's work, they are working together to continue Jesus' ministry in the world. You see, at this point, Jesus had gone back to heaven, and he had left his church. And throughout the New Testament, we see the church called the body of Christ. You see, Jesus' body has movement when we as a church move in God's spirit. We are the body of Christ with different parts when we are being faithful in the gifts that God has given to us. You see, every time we serve God, Jesus' body has movement, it has life. 
You see, you and I, when we are obeying God and we are living the way that God has designed us, we are the body of Christ and the body of Christ is moving forward. So whether your gift is preaching or whether your gift is singing, maybe you're someone who wants to coach young people. Maybe your gift is being with people who are going through a difficult time. Whatever your gift might be, when we're all doing our part, Jesus' body has life and it moves forward. So when I think about what does this verse have to do with you and I as we are in this season of new beginnings, as we are gathering the crew around the table and we are trying to figure out a way forward, Here's what I think this means for NBC. We will be an effective church if each of us plays our God-given part and does it well. We will be an effective church when we appreciate the different gifts and talents that each person in this church body has. That's where we'll be effective. Not because we find a you know, good preacher or we have the best worship team. But we will be an effective church here in Barto when each of us embraces who God has made us to be and we live into that and we enjoy it and we appreciate one another's gifts. So here's the main point this morning. An effective church is always a team effort. An effective church is always a team effort. It requires every part to do its job. It requires every member to do his or her work that God has appointed to them. An effective church is not the work of an effective pastor. An effective church is not the work of those who give the most. An effective church, it takes all of us, you and me, with our different gifts and talents. An effective church is always a team effort. So there's three things that I think that this means for us. Number one, we should remember that our roles should always complement each other, not compete with one another. Let me say that again. Our different roles should complement each other, not compete with one another. You see, the church needs people who work in the background just as much as it needs people who work in the foreground. Let me say that again. The church needs people who work in the background just as much as it needs people that work in the foreground. You see, there's unfortunately a tendency often in the church for us to focus on those who we see up front on Sunday mornings, and we forget about those who are necessary, who work in the background and who do different things that may go unseen. Their roles are not less significant because they're not on this platform. You see, our God-given roles work together to accomplish God's purposes for the church. I like to think of um, someone who comes to mind with this point. The church that I grew up in, there's this one usher, Brother Wade. He's been an usher since before my mother was born, I think. He's been an usher a long, long time. And I've seen him every single Sunday morning that I go to church there. He always makes people feel welcome and appreciated in the house of God. He's one of those ushers that has no judgments. He's just glad to see you. And he has this big smile. Brother Wade's never preached a sermon. Sister Katrina, he can't sing. I've heard him. He can't sing. But he can shake hands. He can make people feel welcome. He can make you feel like you belong in the house of God. His role matters. His role complements what the church is doing. You see, our roles are meant to work together, not apart from one another. You need Brother Wade just as much as you need the preacher. You need Brother Wade just as much as you need the other pastors. You need Brother Wade just as much as you need the worship team. His role matters. And the Bible tells us that the church is made stronger by its many diverse parts. NBC, we need those of you who have no fear in going and knocking on your neighbor's door and inviting them to church. We need some of you who like to cook. I think of a few few months ago when we did Pastor Sands Appreciation, some of you all threw down. You put more than your toe in whatever you cooked. You threw your whole house in there. It was excellent. We need people who have different gifts. So number one, our roles should complement each other, not compete with one another. But number two, we need to remember that all gifts are useful in God's house. All gifts are useful in God's house. I want you to hear from me as your pastor. There is no such thing as a gift that God has given to you that has no value to the church. 
Let me say that again. There is no such thing as a gift that God has given to you that is not valuable to the church. Again, I'm, I realize that not everyone is going to preach. Not everyone is going to sing. But some of you, you know how to educate people. You can teach people how to build a budget. A lot of people need help managing their finances. You might know how to help people meal plan so that they can be healthier. Maybe you know about the different resources here in Bard so that people can use for mental health. Maybe you have a habit of just being able to sit with people and listen to them. There is no gift that is so small or insignificant that it cannot be used for the glory of God. There is no such thing as a God-given gift that has no value to the church. I can remember back in 2008 when I was a young adults pastor out in Brooksville. Uh, how many of you remember 2008? It was not a good year, right? That's when we were going headlong into one of the worst recessions ever. I remember they had stopped building whole neighborhoods just outside of our church and they bulldozed them because they couldn't sell the houses anymore. About 50% of the people in our church lost their jobs because they all worked in the construction industry. And I remember one of the women in our church, she had a gift to do uh, extreme couponing. Any of you ever heard of extreme couponing where they can, they can basically make the church, or not the church, they can basically make the store pay for whatever they get? They get free stuff. She was one of those. She could have been on a TV show. And because so many of the uh, people in our church had lost their jobs and were really struggling, she said, uh, would it be possible if I taught a couponing class to show people how they can use coupons to, to, to get more food for less money and to make it through? So our pastor said, sure, you, you can do that. And we had about 20 people who went through that class. And I believe that that helped a number of them save money and get through this difficult time. Her gift mattered. Her gift made a difference in the house of God. You see, the reality is that every gift can contribute to the church's mission in one way or another. You know, when Paul says you are the body of Christ, he didn't just mean that that was the church leaders. He didn't mean that that was just those who have been saved for 40 years. He said if you're a believer and you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are the body of Christ. And so I say that to you this morning. You are the body of Christ with your different gifts and your different experiences. You are the body of Christ with your different journeys and the different ways that you have found God. You are the body of Christ in the different places that you serve and work during the week. So not only should our roles complement each other, our gifts should also, we should realize that all gifts are useful in God's house. But finally, we need to recognize this, NBC. Our church's effectiveness will only be as strong as our unity. Let me say that again. Our church's effectiveness will only be as strong as our unity. There's a reason that Paul calls the church a body. A body is made up of many different parts that have different functions that have to work towards a common purpose together. The church is a body, it's a team made up of different people working towards one common goal, and that's loving God and loving others. A church that's going in different directions is not going to be an effective church. This church will see its greatest days when we are of one accord, when we're of one mind, when we're working towards one goal. We can only be as strong as our unity. Now, I've done a good bit of coaching in my younger years. Um, I always coached team sports. One of the hardest things about coaching team sports, believe it or not, and Brother Loy, you could probably attest to this, is not teaching people how to do the different skills that they need to play the game. So when I coached football, um, the hardest thing for me to do was not to teach guys how to remember plays or how to throw a football. It wasn't to teach them how to tackle. Believe it or not, the hardest thing about coaching is getting people to realize they must play together in order to win. Team sports, at the end of the day, the best ones are those teams that have figured out how to work together to accomplish the goal. It is then said that a team's unity is actually more important than their athletic ability. Let me say that again. A team's unity is more important than their athletic ability. And we can transfer that to the church. A church's unity is more important than its music ministry. A church's unity is more important than the amount of money that it has in the bank. A church's unity is even more important than the size of its congregation. 
A church's unity is more important than the size of its building. A church's unity is more important than its website or its social media. At the end of the day, an effective church must have a body mindset in order to be effective. It reminds me of the old hymn that says, Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. I see an NBC five years from now that is standing together, making a difference in Barto, not for its own glory, but for the glory of God. Not because they have a good preacher, not because they have a good worship team, not because they have a great building, but because they stand together. In five years, I see an NBC that is ministering to people, meeting them where they're at, seeing people come in off the streets and get saved. I see an NBC that is making headlines because it is giving back to the community, not taking from the community. I see an NBC that is effective because everyone is bringing something different to the table for the sake of God's glory. I see an NBC that is flourishing. Not just because we figured out how to have a good Sunday service, but because we all have these different beautiful gifts and talents that God has given us, and we use them for the glory of God. That's a church that I want to be a part of. I don't just want to be a part of a church that that grows for numbers sake. I want to be a part of a church that makes a difference. And we can only do that if we are a church that realizes that we are many parts We're many parts, but we are one body. So there's two prayer points that I want us to focus on over the next week. The first thing that I want us all to pray about is for God to show us our gifts. I want you to ask God to show you what your gifts are. I want you to write those down. Now, your gifts may be something that you're already doing. Like this, the lady at the church who was a a couponing expert. I believe that that was a God-given gift. People in our church continue to eat as a result of her gift. So I want you to ask God, what are the gifts that you have given to me that can make a difference in the church? The second prayer point is this. And this is really important as we are getting ready to launch a new ministry plan in January. And I'm very, very excited about it. But here's the thing. It's going to require all of us to be on deck. It's going to be require, require all of us to be on mission. It's going to require all of us to contribute. So the second prayer point is this. I want you to ask God to show you what your contribution is to NBC. How can you contribute to the mission of this local body? Maybe it's praying. Maybe it's you want to help with our children's church. We have a whole children's church area, and I I have a thought that one day we may have to move the children's church to here. There will be so many of them. Thank you. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we had to figure out a different way of doing church because we have so many kids that we're ministering to? Maybe your gift is that you know how to sit with those who are elderly and shut in. We have a lot of elderly people in our neighborhood, and some of them sit home alone all day. Wouldn't it be nice if once a week someone from NBC could go and just sit with them, listen to their stories? That adds life to those who are shown. I want you to ask God to show you what your contribution can be. I believe that each of us has something to contribute, and when we do that, we will be a more effective church. This is our house here at NBC. God's given it to us, and I believe that God wants us to do things well but it takes each of us contributing to God's mission here in order for us to be effective. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and pray this morning. Jesus, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Lord, I pray that as we go our separate ways, that we would sincerely begin to see the different gifts and talents that you have given us. And Lord, that you would show us different ways that we can use them for your glory. God, I believe that you've given every person in this house a ministry. And even though our ministries may look different from one another, God, that's okay. We know that we need our different gifts and talents in order to do the mission that you called us to. And Lord, I also pray that you would begin to plant a seed and grow that seed in every person's heart. Lord, that they would grow with a sense of how they can contribute to your mission here. 
God, that you would give them a desire to use the different gifts and talents that you've given to them to contribute to the body. Because, Lord, we are a stronger body when we are all contributing. So, Lord, we thank you for this time and we pray that we would be a church that remembers that though we have many diverse gifts and we have many different stories, Lord, you called us to be one body in one church. We pray these things in your name. Let the church God say amen. Amen. Amen.